right. Well, give me just one second and we are getting on Facebook Live. All right, one more second while Facebook queues up here. Okay, we are all set and ready to go. So welcome everybody. My name is Harmony. I work with the Fix It Fair and we are joined today with Tristan from Community Energy Project. And we are so happy to have you. Just a couple housekeeping items before I turn things over. Um, we love questions. So if at any point you have a question, we'll go ahead and use the chat feature, whether you're joining us on Zoom or on Facebook. Just drop a, a question in the chat and then I'll read it out loud. So that way we can capture it for the recording here. Um, again, if you have any questions, just let us know. And that is at the bottom of your screen. If you just take your mouse on Zoom and you can hover over the bottom and that should pop up your, your Q&A area. So we are broadcasting this live on Facebook. Again, just drop a question in the comments, just like you would if you were leaving a comment on a normal post. And I'll go ahead and read those questions out loud too. And so with that, welcome Tristan. I'll go ahead and hand things over to you. Thanks. All right, thank you, Harmony. Um, so like, uh, like I was introduced, I'm Tristan. I'm with Community Energy Project. Uh, we're a nonprofit located here in Portland. Um, and as part of our work, um, we work with Portland Water Bureau and the Lead Hazard, Hazard Reduction Partners team. So we're just one of several groups in this area that focus on lead poisoning uh, prevention. And our piece is specifically on education. So we'll be going over some of this info today. Um, also, CEP Community Energy Project does a few other programs. So we have our educational workshops on lead poisoning prevention. Uh, we also have some workshops on DIY weatherization, so keeping warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Um, and then we've also started a Oregon Community Solar Program, if you're interested in checking that out. Um, and then in, in addition to these, we do some in-home services, um, so things like energy efficiency and safety upgrades, um, mostly for seniors and people with disabilities. So if that's something you are ever interested in, uh, feel free to come check out our website or I'll give out my contact info at the end here. Right, so the basic info I'm going over today is just sort of a background on lead, what it is and why it's bad for us, um, and then how we can stay safe from it. So where lead is commonly found. <clears throat> Right, so lead is a metal and it's existed as long as the earth has existed as just naturally occurring and already in our ground. Um, but we've used it for thousands of years for a lot of different things. Um, we've known its harmful effects for a really long time, but we've also used it for a lot of different applications as well. Um, even as far back as ancient Rome, we saw lead pipes used to transfer drinking water and lead containers used to store wine too. Um, lead actually has a sort of sweet taste to it, uh, if you were to taste some lead. Um, so uh, as things contaminated wine and water, uh, it actually enhanced the flavor. So that was sort of a purposeful thing done a few thousand years ago. Um, but now we know that it's unhealthy for us. Um, and so we do our best to eliminate it from our environment. <clears throat> Hey, Tristan, it's Harmony. I just want to double check. I don't see um, a shared presentation. So if we're not there yet, that's really cool. But Oh, and it looks like you're on mute now, too. <laughs> Um, it looks like my sharing settings might be locked. Oh, here we go. Perfect. I see it now. Oh. Let's start to interrupt. Go ahead. <laughs> no, it's good. Before I get too far into talking without my visual presentation. Um, but yeah, moving onward, um, just to touch on a few places we see lead. Uh, the most common place we see lead, especially around here, is going to be in old paint. Um, so we use lead for a lot of different things, but usually where we see it now is just in paint. 
Um, one of the most common places we used to uh, use paint was in the household, um, especially uh, in places that experienced a lot of friction or temperature and moisture changes because that lead paint um, at the time was very durable. So it was a great place to, to use it. Um, but now we know that this lead paint uh, has some bad health effects for us that I'll get into a little more in a minute here. <clears throat> um, so uh, we've stopped using that lead paint as in residential homes uh, in 1978. Um, so if our home is newer than 1978, there's no risk of lead-based paint in there. Um, but if it's built before then, it's possible some of our older paint layers do have that lead in there. Um, and we'll get more in depth into that in a minute here. Um, also, gasoline was a popular place we saw lead. Uh, so now when we go to the gas station, we see that it says unleaded on the pump, and that's because it was leaded at one point. Um, but in the last two decades, we've stopped using that. Um, actually, just recently, the, the last country in the world stopped using leaded gas for cars. Um, in the U.S., we mostly stopped using uh, leaded gas back in the 90s uh, and uh, a lot of that uh, lead in the gas actually came out through the exhaust on the other end of the car and went into our air where people got to breathe it in um, and some of that lead even settled onto the ground and is still in the ground today. <clears throat> All right, so I just want to go over a little bit of the health effects of lead. So the health effects of lead can be really varied depending on the level of exposure and your age and just how your body reacts. Um, so generally, uh, uh, lead exposure will give someone sort of flu-like symptoms. So it can range from things like aches and body pains and fatigue uh, to becoming more serious as the concentration of lead exposure is higher. So you can uh, lead to things like kidney damage or um, kidney pain even. Um, and then up to things like hearing loss and seizure and even death in severe cases. So it's really important to just prevent any exposure from happening in the first place. Uh, there's also long-term health effects that we get. So even long after that lead is gone from our body, uh, we still can be experiencing these long-term health effects that I'll get into uh, more in just a moment here. <laughs> Um, so the way that lead affects us is by entering our body. So it's got to enter our body to cause any of those symptoms. Um, there's only two ways that we can have lead enter our body, and that's going to be by breathing in contaminated dust um, or um, ingesting something that has lead in it. So the way that dust gets contaminated with lead is usually from paint. Uh, so we have that old paint that we used to love to use lead paints on in our homes. And as that lead paint is aged, uh, now it's starting to chip away and peel away uh, from our walls and starting to fall down. And every time it chips and peels away or uh, experiences friction, that lead in the paint is uh, coming out into our air and settling into our dust and floating around our homes in ways that we can then breathe it in. <clears throat> And so the most vulnerable populations to this lead exposure um, is going to be children. So generally children aged zero to six um, or um, uh, yeah, at any children aged zero to six, and that's because there's a huge part of their brains forming, which I will get to in a moment here. Uh, but along with that, um, I like to point out that lead can pass from parent to child uh, during pregnancy and sometimes during breastfeeding. Um, it's not super common, so if uh, you are experiencing uh, pregnancy or breastfeeding and you're worried about lead exposure, uh, it's something you should definitely talk to your doctor about and get lead tested before you make any changes in your life. All right, so I want to go over here what lead is doing in our bodies once it enters. So when lead exposure occurs, that lead is uh, bonding onto our red blood cells and it's gonna stay in our body for around two months or so. Um, and then it's naturally gonna come out through our sweat, saliva, and urine. <clears throat> and while the lead is in our body for those two months or so, it's going to enter a lot of our organ systems, uh, including our brains as well. 
Um, so kidneys are one area that are impacted by lead because they're in charge of filtration and <clears throat> they might try to filter out that lead and have some trouble. Um, you might end up with kidney pain, damage, or even kidney failure in extreme cases. <clears throat> um, lead also can migrate into our bones uh, and then it will stay stable and dormant um, until maybe we have changes later in life with our bones, like in the case of osteoporosis. And then that lead can be released back into our body and give us those acute lead poisoning symptoms um, all over again. <clears throat> um, and then here, the biggest impact and the reason that lead poisoning can be so serious is because of the impact on our brains. Um, so to our body, uh, lead and calcium look very similar. So our body knows that calcium is really healthy for our brain development. Uh, but when we have lead in our body, uh, it uh, absorbs in that lead and the lead will do all of the opposite of what calcium does. So calcium helps build up that gray matter of our brain and strength, strengthens the connections that helps learn um, and form memories and have self-control. Um, but lead will do all the opposite of those. It's going to weaken the gray matter um, and weaken those connections in our brain being formed. Um, so when children expose lead, uh, when children are exposed to lead, uh, they can have these uh, effects on brain development that then last uh, later into life and can lead to things like um, behavioral problems or learning disabilities, even long after that lead is gone. Um, and that's why it's really important to prevent lead exposure, especially in children. Um, so the most common way that young children are exposed to lead um, is usually just because of hand-to-mouth contact. Um, if you've spent any time around um, babies and infants, you know, they love to just put everything straight into their mouth, even if it's maybe not supposed to be there. Uh, <clears throat> children are also low to the ground, uh, so they're more likely to be in places where that lead dust has settled down or that dust from those paint chips have settled down onto the ground. Um, and lead is also measured as a concentration um, in our blood. So since children are a lot smaller than adults, the same amount of lead that might not affect an adult very much might be really serious um, to a child. Um, adults, on the other hand, have an increased risk of lead exposure uh, due to working in occupations that encounter lead. So adults usually are uh, getting exposed to lead through their work. There's a few different industries that can work with lead. So that can be things like construction and demolition work on older homes, especially um, things like recycling facilities and welding and, and many other jobs as well. <clears throat> um, also, just to keep in mind, uh, even if you're doing a DIY project at home, uh, if, it's, if you're dealing with lead-based paints, uh, you can have a similar effect uh, as if you're working on a job site around lead. So it still can affect you. <clears throat> All right, so here I want to go over where we see lead in our everyday lives. Um, so again, that prevention to exposure is really important. So it's good to know where we might see lead um, and then how we can stay safe from those exposure sources. So here I've broken it down into the four most common places we see lead. So I'll go over a little bit about drinking water, um, that lead-based paint we talked about. Uh, lead in soil, and then lastly, some household items uh, and objects that can uh, sometimes have lead in them. Uh, so to start off, I want to talk about lead-based paint, because again, that's the most common source of lead exposure that we'll see in our daily lives. So uh, it's been a few decades since that lead-based paint ban in 1978. Um, so our, our newest layer of paint in our home is probably not going to contain lead. You know, it's very likely we've repainted since the 70s. Um, so it's those older layers of paint underneath that once they start peeling away or experiencing friction can be exposing us to lead. Um, so this is a really great picture to see what that peeling away can look like. Um, windows are an area that we see lead paint exposure happen from a lot because of those windows frames. Uh, especially on our older homes uh, <clears throat> that experience a lot of friction around those windows. Um, every time we're touching them or opening and closing them, we're uh, putting friction up on that older paint and it all can start to chip away. 
So again, the year lead-based paint was banned for residential homes was 1978. Um, so if you're not sure how old your home is, a really great website to use is portlandmaps.com. Um, so if you live in the Portland area, uh, you can look up any address on here and see what year that building was built. Um, so here's an example of our, our previous office we used to be in at CEP. Um, we looked up our address to see how old our building is, and you can see here it was built in 1937. So that's definitely well before the 1978 ban on lead-based paint. Um, so it's possible some of the older layers of paint um, have lead in them, uh, but everything's covered up with fresh new paint um, and nothing's peeling away or chipping. So we don't really have any risk of lead exposure from paint there. Um, also on the right side of this uh, slide, I like to show because it, um, it really highlights um, that the different ages of homes have a higher probability of containing that lead paint. So back in the 1920s uh, through the 30s, we really loved to use lead-based paint. Uh, it was super popular in the US. Uh, we really loved to use it on areas like kitchens um, or places that experienced a lot of frictions like the, the window frames, for example. Um, so if your home is built around the 20s through about 1940, it's almost guaranteed to have lead-based paint in there somewhere underneath that newer layer of paint. <laughs> um, but after the 40s, it kind of fell out of popularity and we started using it less and less. Um, so if your home is built before 1978, uh, it's not guaranteed to have lead in it, um, but it does become more and more probable um, as your home gets older. Also with that paint is not just in our homes, but sometimes old antique or vintage items can have lead in them as well. Uh, they can have layers of that old lead paint or varnish that can have lead in it. And as we use those items, especially with something like a table that we're touching really frequently, um, it can be exposing us to lead that way. Uh, but it, there's a pretty easy way to test paint. Uh, test paint for lead uh, using lead check swabs. Uh, so this is one of the only EPA ways, uh, EPA approved ways for people to test lead paint in their own home. Um, and it gives you an immediate result. <clears throat> um, basically this test is a, is a little tube that you crush that releases a liquid that will turn red when it uh, comes in contact with lead. So this picture on here is a really great example um, of paint that came up positive with the lead check test uh, for lead paint. And it's going to be a darker red color, the more concentrated, more concentrated that lead paint is. So you might see something more like a lighter pink or like this photo, it's a really dark, vibrant lead, uh, red. And just a note with these, um, the, uh, the lead check swab needs to come uh, physically in contact with that older paint uh, to test it and have a chance to change colors if it's lead. It's not going to go through any paint. Um, so if you live in an older home and want to check if any of your older paints in your home has lead in it, you want to make sure you're uh, checking an area that has that older paint exposed. Um, so you can find a place that's already chipped away or peeling away. Um, or some people uh, will take a little utility knife and actually cut away a small section of the paint to expose all of those layers. Um, and they'll just do it somewhere inconspicuous, like uh, behind a door and down low to the ground. Um, also, just a note with this is that sometimes homes are painted differently in different rooms. Um, I've heard from people that one room was painted with lead paints and then none of the other rooms in their home uh, tested positive for lead paint. So if it's something you're checking on, you want to check several areas in your house just to make sure uh, you know what the results are. All right, so first off, if you have an object that's positive uh, for lead, the safest thing to do is to just throw it away in, in just your regular trash. No, uh, no special disposal uh, method is needed. <clears throat> um, if you have something that's sentimental, maybe it's been in the family for a while, um, you don't want to necessarily just throw it out. You can keep it. Uh, just make sure you're putting it somewhere up and away from children, especially, and it's not something that you're using. So with lead paint in our homes, it's a little bit more involved 
uh, process. <clears throat> so the best thing to do in uh, areas of your home with lead paint uh, <clears throat> to prevent lead poisoning is going to be to keep those painted surfaces in good condition. Um, so that might be repainting any areas that have any deterioration, um, cleaning up any areas that are uh, having dust or paint chips or peeling paint. <clears throat> um, and if you are a renter, make sure you're reporting this deteriorate, deteriorated paint to your landlord or property management. Um, as a tenant, it's actually Oregon state law that all paint inside and outside of rental properties is kept in good condition. So even if it's not lead-based paint, um, landlords and property management has to keep all of that paint in new condition, so not chipping or peeling away. All right, so I'm gonna shift over here um, from paint to talk a little bit about lead in soil. Yeah, so one way we have lead in our soil is just from lead falling off of, uh, falling off of uh, buildings, that lead paint falling just down off the buildings into the ground. Um, or maybe someone did some paint removal in the past that left uh, a lot of paint chips falling down to the ground. Um, also that gasoline contributed to lead contamination in our soil. So about 75% of the lead that was added to gasoline was just released back out of the exhaust as cars drove around. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, we used leaded gasoline for around 65 years. Uh, so that means that areas along roadways um, that have been really busy uh, and uh, things like highways can still test positive for lead today. Uh, so one of our partner organizations is called Growing Gardens. It's a nonprofit here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, so if you are a resident of Portland and you meet income qualifications for this nonprofit, um, they actually can help you test your soil for free. Um, so Growing Gardens is a really great organization uh, that helps people build gardens in their homes. But even if you're not necessarily building a garden, they can still help you out um, and get that lead testing done. All right, so if you do find that you have uh, leaded soil around your home, uh, there's a few things you want to do to keep safe. Um, so first off, just wearing gloves when you're outside doing garden work or doing something uh, involving that soil. Uh, it's going to help keep your hands clean so you're not later transferring that uh, lead particles to other surfaces or to your mouth on accident. Second, um, any, kind of, any kind of ground cover on top of that soil is gonna help limit any dust being kicked up and making any of that lead airborne. So anything like grass, gravel, plants, uh, just simple things like that are all gonna help keep that dust down. Mm -hmm. uh, lastly, if you wanna add something to your home, like a, a sandbox for kids to play in or a garden, for example, uh, the safest thing to do is to avoid digging into the ground and just add it on top of the dirt that's already there. All right, um, since we're talking about soil here, I like to mention a little bit about lead safe cleaning. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a few practices you want to follow if you um, are making sure to do some really thorough lead safe cleaning. So maybe you have soil from your home that has lead that got tracked in, um, or maybe you have those. Uh, uh, chipping paint, uh, chipping and peeling paint in your home that's uh, needing to be cleaned up. So the most important thing to do is to be very thorough in your cleaning um, and to use wet cleaning methods. So things like mopping or using a wet washcloth to wipe surfaces down um, or even a spray bottle and wiping things down as well. Um, so using that water is going to help reduce any dust from being kicked up where we might breathe it or where it might settle in somewhere else. Also using soap in addition to water is going to help bond onto those lead particles and pick them up. Uh, while water alone kind of just spreads those particles around, it may not actually pick them up and cleaning them, clean them. <laughs> um, also, if you're doing this thorough lead safe cleaning, uh, it's recommended to start up high in your room, high up in the room, <clears throat> so that you're not uh, knocking dust down into somewhere you've already cleaned. So go for anywhere that you don't normally clean, just to be very thorough, especially places that build up dust. So things like ceiling fans or the tops of door frames, 
um, all of those types of areas. <laughs> All right. Secondly, if you have carpet in your home, it's a little bit more involved of a process to clean up any uh, lead particles. <clears throat> um, so most regular household vacuums are not going to have the right filters to trap that lead dust and uh, can even just kick up any lead dust into the air and recirculate it and make it actually more likely to be breathed in. Um, so you want to make sure you have a HEPA vacuum. That's a high efficiency particle air filtered vacuum. And it just means that there's really great filters into it and none of the air that's coming back out of the vacuum uh, is uh, going to come out without being filtered. <laughs> it's going to get down to those really small particles of, of lead that we see. <laughs> so um, if you are uh, in need of a HEPA vacuum, anyone who watches this workshop or attends one of our other workshops <clears throat> about lead uh, is welcome to uh, contact us and borrow one of our HEPA vacuums for free for a loan for two weeks. So if that's something you're interested in, um, I'll give out my contact info at the end here, or you can look us up at communityenergyproject.org um, and ask about borrowing our HEPA vacuums. All right, um, so next here, I'm gonna shift over to talking about drinking water. Um, so sometimes we hear about um, a lead in drinking water in different places and different towns, uh, but it's actually very uncommon in the Portland area to have uh, any lead in water. Um, our water source has no detectable lead, um, so our uh, <clears throat> uh, source of water is not going to have any lead in it. Um, and as it comes from our source, that water travels through uh, some water main lines and connectors. And back in the 90s, uh, the Portland Water Bureau actually went through and made sure there was no lead component. So they've replaced any pipes or connectors or pigtails that had lead and made sure they had new non-leaded parts. <laughs> so the danger for lead actually is gonna come from an individual property or a building's own pipes. And sometimes that can look like lead soldering on copper pipes. So uh, we really like to use these copper pipes around 1970 to about the mid 80s. Um, and uh, these copper pipes were sometimes connected together with lead soldering. And as that water sits in the pipes, it can absorb the lead into the water, um, which then can be enough to contaminate our drinking water. All right, so the Portland Water Bureau actually has made it very easy to test any homes drinking water. Uh, it's actually, there's actually a free test um, if you fall under the Portland Water Bureau Service Area. So on the slideshow here, you can see um, the utility districts here. Um, there's several different areas that are covered. Um, and I'll pass along that info um, uh, at the end here. And you also can look up the Portland Water Bureau's um, free water lead testing program. Um, how it works is that you'll sign up and you'll be mailed out um, a testing kit that will have a little prepaid pre-addressed envelope and a testing sample bottle that you'll fill up with your own tap water um, and then send it in in that envelope where a lab will then do the testing. And a few weeks later, you'll get that result. Yeah, so one recommendation to help reduce the risk of lead is going to be to flush out that water system if you haven't used it for six or more hours. Um, so if you've been gone at work all day or maybe overnight and you haven't used that water, um, it's been sitting in the pipes and more likely to have absorbed some lead. Um, so it's recommended about 30 seconds. We let that uh, water just run from our tap and uh, maybe up to two minutes if we live in a really large building. Also using cold water from our tap is going to help reduce any risk of lead. Um, so hot water actually absorbs lead out of those pipes about seven times faster than cold water. Um, so it can be uh, a safer practice to pull cold water out of our tap and then heat it up separately. Um, I also like to note here that boiling water um, will not reduce the level of lead in it. So sometimes boiling water is something that we do to get rid of bacteria. Um, but in the case of lead, since it is metal, it will stay in the water. And as that water evaporates away, it can even concentrate the lead to be even higher. 
All right, so the last section here um, are just a couple other sources of lead I'll go over before we wrap up this presentation. <clears throat> All right, so some objects we see here are dishware. So uh, things like antique or vintage China dishware um, or things like leaded crystal or pottery all can contain lead. Um, so these China dishes, uh, dishware can have that leaded glaze on it. And as we're using it and scraping away with our utensils on it, it can release those tiny particles of lead that then enter our body. Um, then with our uh, pottery, just even the clay soil that pottery is made from can contain lead, just naturally occurring in the soil. Um, and then next, uh, for a few decades ago, especially, we really like to use a leaded crystal, especially that leaded crystal um, glassware. So it's something to be aware of there. Um, also, any small metal metallic item can be suspect. Um, so these images uh, on the slide all have lead, all our items that contain lead. So keys are a sort of surprising one for a lot of people, especially parents, um, because uh, it's actually completely legal for keys to contain lead. And we like to, <clears throat> we like to let uh, kids especially play with keys for, just for fun. They think they're fun jingly toys, but that can be dangerous. So um, I recommend avoid giving your kids keys to play with, um, especially if they're at that age where they're gonna put things straight into their mouths. And um, then also these other small metal objects, um, like cheaper jewelry, especially can contain lead. Um, so it's, it's not legal to have um, lead or higher amounts of lead in items specifically for children. Uh, but sometimes things are just uh, made in such mass quantities that it's not possible to test all of it. Um, so some suspect items are, are Mardi Gras beads um, are actually pretty frequently tested positive for lead. Um, or uh, on the very right here is an example of a little piece of jewelry that uh, was made out of a very high amount of lead content. Um, so next here, I want to touch on occupational exposure a little bit again, just because that's something we might not think about, but we can actually take home lead from our work and be bringing it to our families where they can be exposed to lead. Uh, so lead's really sticky and it likes to stick to our hair and our clothing. Um, and then when we leave work, we're transferring it to our cars. And when we get home, we can be transferring it to um, our family as well. Um, so we recommend having uh, work clothes that you can change out of as soon as you're done with work and you're washing those as soon as you get back home. All right, I have a last few, uh, a last few bits of information here before we wrap up. Um, first off is about blood lead level testing. Um, so the only way we can confirm exposure to lead is to get our blood lead level tested. Um, so there's two ways we do this. Uh, the most common way is the blood screening, uh, which is just a quick finger poke test. Uh, it's sort of like drawing blood sugar if you've done that or seen that done. Um, or we also see a full venous blood draw uh, test done as well. <clears throat> so the three most important times to have blood screened is going to be uh, at, any, at any prenatal appointment during pregnancy. And then children should be tested um, sometime around their first year appointment checkup and around their second year appointment checkup. Um, but if you have any kids in your family who have never been tested at all, that's totally fine. Just next time you're in for uh, vaccinations or physicals or checkup, uh, just ask about getting that blood lead screening test done. All right, so thank you all for listening to this presentation. Um, in summary, lead is natural and humans have done a really good job integrating it into our environment. Um, but everyone can take steps uh, to prevent themselves and their families from being exposed to lead. And attending this workshop and education, educating yourself about lead is just one of those steps that we can take. Thank you. Um, uh, are there any questions? I think I see one in the chat here. Let's see. Yes, this is a question. Does Hillsborough's Water Bureau have free lead testing? 
Um, I actually haven't confirmed Hillsboro uh, specifically, but it should be something pretty easy to find if you uh, look through uh, Hillsboro Water Bureau information. <clears throat> yes, great question. Yes, all right, I've got another question. Um, should old paint chips or uh, paint chips be chipped away or painted over? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the, the main thing with paint is to make sure that nothing's falling off anymore and that it's covered up with new paint. So if things are kind of actively being chipped away, you'll want to clean that up as much as possible. So remove anything that's starting to chip away. <clears throat> Um, so that might involve uh, sand, using a sponge sander uh, to have a wet method to sand that down um, or using a, a paint scraper again with like a spray bottle to keep that wet method going uh, to remove those paint chips just to make it stable so that we can paint over again and not have it be chipped off. <laughs> Hey, Tristan, did you just wrap up? This is Wing. Yes, hi, Wing. It's, hi, it sounds like Harmony's uh, laptop froze up. Uh, oh. So she, <laughs> she just messaged me to uh, see if I could step in and, and help rescue things. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, did we get through Q&A and everything all right? Yeah, I was just answering some questions, but I think that was the last question there. Great, um, wonderful. Yeah, I, I don't know about if there's Facebook questions um, over there, but as far as Zoom, I think we're pretty wrapped up. Okay, let me, I can actually check Facebook as well, just really quick, let me do that. Yes. Yes, so um, I have a follow-up question there about those paint chips. Uh, so the question is, um, is it better to remove the paint chips rather than paint over the loose chips? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, if we paint over those loose chips, they're probably going to dislodge again pretty quickly. Uh, so uh, the best thing to do there again is use those wet methods. Uh, there's lots of information we can look up there too online. Uh, if you get the chance to look up that DIY lead paint um, safety for uh, home projects. Um, so uh, yeah, again, first make sure Nothing's chipping off or peeling away in a way that's going to just chip off and peel again once we paint over it um, and then cover it up once you've got those uh, chips removed. Great. And I don't see any uh, Facebook questions. Okay. Yeah, that's great then. Well, thank you so much for joining. And yeah. Doing the um, of course, uh, thanks for watching. Again, if anyone uh, has questions later on, uh, we're communityenergyproject.org. You can find our contact information there, give us a call or send an email. All right, and with that, I will go ahead and close off here. Great, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining. <laughs> Bye for now. <laughs>